All right, I guess we can slowly start. I don't know how many people will show up. But anyway, so this is, um, I don't know, like 24th lecture or something. Uh, so as you know, Ryan is not here, so I'm covering for him. It's kind of funny because, I mean, I teach 251, and literally right now there's a 251 lecture <laughs> in, in Rashid. Uh, so I have someone covering for me <laughs> for that. <laughs> so OK. Um, so we're going to talk about polynomial hierarchy today. Um, so you know, in complexity theory, we like to uh, define uh, complexity classes. You know, we like to put problems uh, or classify problems in terms of like the amount of resources you need to solve those problems, and then put these uh, problems into different complexity classes, and then study uh, how these complexity classes relate to each other, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, in this study, I mean, you've seen uh, many complexity classes like, you know, well, obvious examples are like P, polynomial time, and P, non-deterministic polynomial time, log space L, um, non-deterministic log space NL, P space, polynomial space, um, X, exponential time, non-deterministic exponential time, and so on and so forth. So there's a big zoo of complexity classes, actually, and you can, you can Google complexity zoo, and you will, uh, you will see that zoo. There are... Uh, thousands of uh, complexity classes. Uh, and one of those important complexity classes is the polynomial hierarchy. Uh, so I'm going to introduce uh, this to you. Uh, it's, yeah, as you'll see, it's kind of like uh, mind-bending a little bit. Like the first time you see uh, the definition of MP, it's kind of can be a little bit mind-bending. Like you're not used to that kind of uh, definition. And then here you'll see that there's like a hierarchy of mind bending going on, okay? And, but it's cool, like when your mind is being bent like that, then you really know you're learning something new. Uh, okay, so first I want to, um, hey, uh, I want to uh, remind you the definition of CoMP. So I'm told that you know you're comfortable with CoMP, more or less. Uh, but let me just remind you very quickly what CoMP is. So um, for uh, L, uh, a language sigma in sigma star, uh, the complement of L is sigma star uh, minus L. And then we can define uh, co and P, uh, this is definition, um, as all those languages such that the complement is in NP. Right? So that's one uh, way to define uh, CoMP, and we know that, for example, uh, if I draw these things, I guess, so this is, let's say, NP, this is CoNP, and P lives here, and you have your NP complete languages here, and you have your CoMP complete languages uh, living there. So we believe these uh, lang uh, uh, complexity classes are different. Um, so you might say, like, what's the motivation to define CoMP? Well, the motivation is, well, MP is a one-sided definition. Uh, it requires you to uh, verify efficiently yes instances. Uh, but um, there are situations where you might want to verify no instances efficiently. So, for example, if you take the complement of SAT, um, and if I said this complement of SAT in MP, well, you know, if you think about it, you're going to run into trouble. How do you uh, come up with a short proof that verifies that a certain uh, Boolean formula is not satisfiable, right? Um, so, uh, but these problems, not SAT or like not click, or take any MP complete problem, look at its complement. These problems live in some natural complexity class. Uh, the natural complexity class that they live in is CoMP. Uh, OK, so now I want to actually define CoMP uh, in a bit different way that resembles actually the definition of MP. Uh, so first, let me remind you the definition of MP very quickly. Uh, so we say that uh, L is an MP if there exists a polytime Turing machine V and 
a polynomial, uh, let's call it P. So there are various equivalent definitions of MP, but in this lecture, I want uh, to use this particular definition. So L is an MP if there is a poly time Turing machine V and there is a polynomial P such that uh, X is in the language if and only if there exists some U where the, the length of U is equal to this polynomial uh, with the input being the size of X and V X U is one. So uh, one thing that I'll just highlight here is that I'm insisting that the certificate U is exactly of length P of X. This is okay to do. Uh, if, if this was less than or equal to, I mean, I can like artificially pad the uh, proof string. Uh, so this is, this is not a problem, but it's a convenient, uh, it's gonna be convenient for us to say that it's exactly P of X. Okay, good, so that's the definition. And then you can say, okay, look, this is, I can rewrite this condition if I just negate both sides. I can rewrite it as X not in L, if and only if. How do you negate this? How do you negate the right-hand side here? It's for all U, where U is of this length. V X U is zero. Uh, okay, so that's equivalent. But now you can say, well, this is like equivalent to X in L complement. Right, so X is an L complement if and only if for all U uh, of polynomial length, Vxu is equal to uh, zero. Uh, yeah, so then, you know, at this point you can say, cool, why don't I then define CoMP uh, in this way so I can say, uh, we'll say that, so this is definition, L is in CoMP, if there exists polytime uh, Turing machine V, uh, there exists a polynomial P such that X is in L if and only if for all U Now, okay, so here we have XU. I don't want to put it to be zero. I'm going to change here the meaning of zero and one and put a one there. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make the definition uh, any different. Okay, if I change the true to false and false to true. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so there are various ways to think about CoMP, okay? So one way to just define it this way. Another way is like, okay, you know, um, CoMP is the class of languages where you can verify no instances efficiently. Uh, or you can say it in this way where you say, oh, you know, the yes instances, a yes instance is a yes instance if and only if for all U uh, where the U is polyomial length, VXU, there is this verifier where VXU outputs one. Okay, so, all right, and now let's put this up here. So one thing, I'll make a quick observation, a simple observation. Um, so P equals MP implies uh, NP equals coin. Okay, and well, that's also equal to P. So why is that the case? Can someone tell me why P equals MP implies MP equals coMP?
by the way, this is equivalent to saying that MP not equal to co MP implies P not equal to MP. So in case you were working on separating MP from co MP, you should know that that implies P is different from MP. So why is this the case? Well, P is equal to MP, then co MP is equal to co P. But what is co P? Co P is P. Okay? You take the negation of a language in P, you get something in P. Okay, so that's just a small observation. Uh, we might need it later. Uh, okay, so now, fine, we have this class MP, we have this class co MP. Uh, let me now define a language for you and let's see if it falls in MP or co MP. Uh, so this language I'm going to call E clique. E stands for exact, exact clique pro, uh, language. So this is the language of words G, K, where G is a graph. Uh, uh, in which the largest clique, uh, the largest clique is of size K. Okay, and when I say K, I mean exactly K. The largest clique has size exactly K. So let me ask you now, is E clique in NP? Is E clique in co -MP? So how would you um, how would you prove that a graph's largest clique is of size exactly k? Like you could say, okay, I'm going to give you as proof a clique of size k, and then fine, I can check that. I can say yes, this graph does have a clique of size k, but that does not prove to me that the largest clique is of size exactly k. There could be maybe a bigger clique. You haven't proved that to me. So that doesn't work, um, and you can try other things. I don't think you'll be successful. You can also think about, oh, can I uh, put it in co-MP? Is it like naturally in co-MP? How do I show that the largest clique uh, is not of size k? Right, so you're gonna, you're gonna run into trouble. I mean, that's kind of the point uh, of this example anyway, uh, but but yeah, I mean, what's the natural description if I were to like write this uh, in some sense like in English? Uh, so I would say, well, a, a, a tuple is going to be an e click if there exists some set, set of vertices, uh, S and V, where the size of S is K, uh, such that S is a clique, it X forms a clique. And not only that, but and for, let me write it here, for all S prime subset of the vertices where S prime is of size K plus one, uh, S prime is not a clique. Right, so this kind of describes this problem well. You know, you want a clique of size k, but at the same time, for all subset of vertices of size k plus one, they should not form a clique. So then, in that case, you would know great than uh, my largest clique of size k. But what I like to emphasize here is the uh, number of quantifiers. There's a there exists, plus there's a for all. Okay. Now let me give you another example. Smallest uh, circuit uh, 
So this is uh, the language that consists of Boolean circuits uh, such that C is the smallest circuit uh, computing, um, let's call it the function that C computes. Okay, so by C sub f, I mean the function that C computes. Every Boolean circuit computes some function. Okay, some function it computes. And I want C to be such that there's no other circuit smaller than C that computes that same function. Okay, so this is the smallest circuit. And again, I can ask, like, you know, is smallest circuit in MP uh, or is smallest circuit in co MP? And if you can think about it, and you won't be able to put it naturally in MP or co MP. Uh, and here again, let me add like an English description to this one as well. Uh, so here it's more like for all um, C prime, circuit C prime, uh, with size of C prime is uh, less than size of C. What do I want? Maybe you can complete it. For all circuits smaller than C prime, I want it not to compute the same function as C does. So it should disagree with C in some place. So there exists some x such that C of x is different from C prime of x. OK? Again, for all, there exists two quantifiers. Here we had there exists for all. This is for all there exists. And now, OK, so as you can see, it's kind of suggesting like maybe we should uh, come up with a new complexity class to capture these problems. These are natural problems, right? These are not like uh, very funky problems. These are very natural problems. They don't naturally fall in MP or co-MP. What's a natural class that we can put these uh, class uh, languages in? Okay. So this is one uh, motivation for it. I mean, also like, you know, if you imagine like you're a researcher in the mid 20th century and you have like um, this definition of MP and this definition of co-MP, it's kind of natural to ask like, well. You know, these have one quantifiers. What if I add more quantifiers? It's a very natural thing to generalize in that way, right? And see what kind of thing you get. OK, so let me do that now. So let me actually add a little notation here that I will use throughout. Notation. Uh, so I will write there exists with like a superscript. Uh, and then some variable u, this is going to mean uh, there exists u where uh, u is in sigma star and uh, the size of u is exactly a. Okay, so when I use this notation there exists a u, I mean there exists a u in sigma star whose length is exactly a. Similarly, for all a u, this means for all u and sigma star with u equals a. OK, so now uh, let me define u. Uh, these complex, this complexity class that captures uh, these problems. So we're going to say that L is in, so here's an unfortunate uh, clash in notation. So this is going to be called sigma 2. So this sigma is not the same as the alphabet sigma, OK? Uh, but it's the way it's used, so unfortunately I have to use sigma. So L is in sigma 2. Um, if uh, there exists. Uh, polytime Turing machine V, there exists a polynomial P such that 
x is in the language, if and only if, there exists uh, with a polynomial uh, length u, u1 actually, for all polynomial length u2, vx u1 u2 equals 1. Okay, so I took the definition of MP, I added one more quantifier, I made it, I added a for all. Okay. And actually, uh, I will, uh, is there like a colored chalk here somewhere? Not really, okay, it doesn't matter. So I'll, I'll actually, into this definition, add another definition. So I'll put that as in parentheses. So I'll say that L is in pi 2, if the same thing, but now the condition is uh, that x is in L, if and only if, for all, it, now it starts with a for all quantifier, for all u1, there exists u2, and the rest is the same. Okay. So any, so the definition should be more or less clear. I mean, it's very similar, as you can see, to MP and co-MP. It's just one more uh, quantifier. I'll make a little observation here. Uh, observation, pi 2 is actually co-sigma 2, which we would define as all those languages such that the complement is in sigma 2. Again, I apologize for the notation, like this sigma is not the same as the sigma, they're different. Um, you might ask, why do you think you know, there's a sigma here? Like, why do we use this notation? So, yeah, I mean, you think of this as like, okay, there, it starts with a there exists. There exists is usually, you know, associated with or, taking an or, and or is usually associated with a sum. Okay, and then the other one, pi, is like, well, this starts with for all. For all is associated with a, uh, a product uh, or ands, and this is a product, so that's the product there, product notation. So that's one way to remember which one is which. You look at which quantifier it starts with. There exists for all. Uh, and yeah, this is like an observation. I mean, you, can, you, you should be able to uh, see that. I'm not going to waste too much time on this. Uh, but yeah, so pi 2 is co of uh, sigma 2. And now I claim um, yeah, so claim claim that this guy E clique, let's say, is in sigma 2. Okay, so let me give you the proof idea here. Proof, you know, sketch, if you want, or idea. So when you want to show uh, E click is in sigma 2, well, you go to your definition and say, okay, I need to come up with a verifier V and a polynomial P such that this is satisfied. Um, so, uh, need. Um, v and P satisfying the definition, okay? So the P is going to be like, we can basically pick P to be um, like linear. That should uh, do the trick. You don't need P to be too long. 
and yeah, let me see if I can. Yeah, let's let me try to squeeze in the verifier here. So def. Um, so this is the verifier v. It takes x, u1, u2. Okay, and step one is what? How do we how do we do this kind of thing in the uh, two fifty one? <laughs> Check for a valid. So if x is not equal to g k, if x does not equal. So here x u one u two these are arbitrary strings. If x first of all is not like a valid encoding, uh, then you uh, you should just reject. Okay, so then we have a valid encoding, a valid instance. Then uh, what do I want? If so, I'll just say this because you know, at first time you see it, it may not be, it may not come natural to you. Uh, but yeah, so if u1 is not or does not correspond to uh, a k clique in the graph G, then reject. Okay, so first what I want is that you want to correspond to an actual K click. Um, so again, like you should you should have this uh, in mind, like this is trying we're trying to mimic this idea here uh, in our verifier. Number three um, if U2 corresponds to corresponds to a k plus one clique, a clique of size k plus one. That's not a good sign. Reject. And otherwise, you can accept. So now we can like check whether this v satisfies our definition. Um, so if x is an L, uh, when x is an L, so do we have that there exists u1 such that for all u2, v, x, u1, u2 uh, accepts? Well, what's going to be the u1? If x is an L, first of all, there is a clique of size k. The largest clique of size, uh, largest clique in the graph is of size k. So I can, I'm going to expect this u1 to be that correspond to that clique of size k, All right? And so uh, for the first step is good. Like I'm not going to reject there. Second step, u1. Okay, so there will be a u1 where uh, I won't reject in second step. It will make me happy with if you give me the k clique. Uh, three, if u2 corresponds to a k plus one clique. No matter what u2 you give me, it cannot correspond to a k plus one clique in this graph, right? So I will never reject. There will never be a u2 that makes me reject. Okay, so that means that for all u2 now, given that u1, given that u1, for all u2, I will accept as, as, uh, as I should. Okay, so it's... As I said, it's kind of mind-bending. You have to play around with two quantifiers. Uh, you don't want to do that when it gets to three quantifiers. We'll see, we'll see that too. But um, yeah, so that's like if x is an L, I hopefully uh, I can say like when, when u1 corresponds to uh, a k clique, which, which the graph does have. We accept. Uh, we accept no matter what u2 is, for all u2. Now, what about if x is not in the language? 
Well, there are several ways that it cannot, it's not in the language. One is like the trivial case where like it doesn't even correspond to a valid encoding. Then we automatically reject. So let's say go case by one, case by case. One, um, if, uh, let's say let's, x is not equal to gk, and in this case, uh, always reject. This is for all, for all u1, u2. Okay, so if x is not in the language, what I want is that uh, for all u1, there exists some u2 that makes the verifier reject. And in this case, I'm saying for all u1, not only there exists a u2, but for all u2, that's okay. It's more than I need. Uh, the verifier rejects. Uh, what about another case? So it could be the case that um, uh, largest clique is at least k, or more than k, I should say. Then what? Well, uh, if the largest clique is more than k, first of all, if u1 does not correspond to a k clique, we reject anyway. If u1 does correspond to a k clique, uh, then there exists some u2 that makes, there should exist some u2 that makes me reject. And that u2, of course, is going to be the string that corresponds to a k plus 1 clique that does exist by this assumption, right? So uh, I'll say that for all u1, there exists u2. So this is a clique. This u2 is a clique. Um, let me say k, k plus 1 clique. Uh, which leads to reject. OK. And then the third case is um, largest clique is less than k. So then, then what's the situation? Where do I reject? St step two, in step two, I'm going to reject, right? So u1 will never correspond to a k-clique. It cannot correspond to a k-clique. So for all u1, and then it doesn't matter what u2 is. I'm not even checking what u2 is. So one, uh, once I detect that u1 does not correspond to a, a k click, then for every u2, whatever it is, I'm going to reject. So here, um, for all u1 and for all u2, you reject. Verifier rejects. So as I said, you know. By the, what the definition requires is like you want for all u1 that there exists a u2, that it makes it reject. But sometimes it's like for all u1, for all u2 you reject, and that's fine. If you have for all u2, that implies there exists a u2. OK, so that was just like to give you some, uh, I mean, I did that in uh, some level of detail to give you some intuition about how to think about these things. Uh, I'll also say, uh, with, I'm not going to prove this. But this is an exercise for you. Smallest circuit uh, is in pi 2. OK, and the proof is exercise. Or maybe it's show up in the homework. I don't know.
OK, so let me come back here. If you have any questions, let me know. OK, so now obviously we're not going to just stop at two quantifiers, right? We're just going to keep going. Uh, all right, so let uh, me give you some notation. So as you can imagine, I can take this definition and I can say, oh, L is in sigma 3. If there exists a polynomial time Turing machine V, there exists a polynomial P, so I said X is in L, if and only if, you know, there exists U1 for all U2, there exists U3 such that Vx, U1, U2, U3 is 1. Right? So I can just add another quantifier uh, to this. So I'm not going to like write that definition down, but instead let me just give you the notation here. Uh, so first of all, sigma 0, uh, pi 0. So this index z i refers to uh, the number of quantifiers. Okay? So this is just going to be good old polynomial time p. Okay, no, if you don't have any quantifiers, it's polynomial, it's p. Um, now, sigma 1 actually corresponds to mp. Okay, one quantifier, there exists quantifier. This is mp. And pi 1 corresponds to co-mp. Okay, uh, one for all quantifier. And actually, I'm even going to write this uh, as... So this is like a notation that I'm introducing now. I'm going to write this as there exists p. Okay? And I'm going to write this coin p as for all p. Okay? So I have these quantifiers, and at the end I have a polynomial time machine. Okay? So you have the quantifiers and then your polynomial time verifier. So then, you know, sigma 2 is equal to... Um, there exists, I'm going to write it this way, for all p. Okay, so this is a good way to remember it. There exists for all p, and then pi 2 is for all, there exists p. And then keep going. There exists for all, there exists p, pi 3 for all, there exists for all p. And you go like this. In general, uh, you can say like sigma i is equal to, there exists uh, sigma, uh, not sigma, pi, pi i minus 1. And in general, pi i is for all, and then sigma i minus 1. Okay, so for each fixed i, we can define these complexity classes. Um, just again, an observation. Um, so this is the observation is that sigma i is always contained in, uh, well, first of all, sigma i plus 1. But it's also always contained in pi i plus 1. And similarly, we have uh, pi i is contained in pi i plus 1. And pi i is contained in uh, sigma i plus 1. So why is this the case? Um, so let's say like you take sigma 3. Sigma, uh, or let me, let me put, no, uh, let me take sigma 2. So sigma 2 is contained in sigma 3. Yeah. So um, is there a reason why, like, when, so when we go from sigma 2 to sigma 3, why do we have to put just one, like, there is this, like, why, is there a reason why we can't, like, change the ordering, or does it have to be, like? Oh, yeah, the changing ordering can, yeah. It, yeah, it has to be alternating. 
So yeah, here's, a, here's one thing I can tell you is that if you have two there exists in a row, you can collapse them into one there exists. Okay, so if you had like there exists u1 and there exists u2, okay, so just take this as like there exists, well, just combine them together, u1, u2. And that will be your new u. You will call that u. Okay, so you can just turn anything into this. Yeah, so it, has, it will always be alternating. You can make it, yeah. Good question. Okay. So now, yeah, and then here, like, if you say, like, sigma 2 is contained in sigma 3, um, why is that the case? Like, adding more quantifiers gives you more power. Right? It cannot restrict you. It can give you more things to do. You can always ignore uh, one of the quantifiers. You can say, oh, that's a dummy quantifier. Um, it's there, but it's dummy. I'm not going to even look at it kind of thing. Okay? So that's kind of the intuition. Uh, so that allows you to uh, say like, well, you know, here I have three quantifiers, but here, um, you know, if I just forget about this one, it's like uh, pi 2. If I forget about that one, it's like sigma 2 and so on. Okay? Um, so you have these inclusions. So having more quantifiers only gives you more power. And now the, um, the basically the title, title of the lecture is the polynomial hierarchy, right? So let me define you now what this is. Okay. So this is going to be the complexity class that we call PH, polynomial hierarchy, which is the union over uh, all i of, so you can take it as sigma i, but that's going to be equal to the union over all i pi i. Okay, and the reason for this equality is because of this observation. So, uh, basically, intuitively, a language is an uh, pH, okay, if you can describe it with some constant number of quantifiers. Okay. So let me write that down. So if L isn't pH, then, uh, then L is in, let's say, sigma i or uh, L is in pi i. You can also write this way for some for some constant i. Okay, but the number of quantifiers maybe I should highlight cannot depend on the input length. Okay, it's always some fixed constant. You can put it in. Okay, and then now with this definition and this observation, we have a nice picture coming up. picture is this. So we have um, we have P. P is contained in NP. It's contained in CoMP. NP is sigma 1. CoMP is pi 1. Sigma 1 is contained in sigma 2. Contained in sigma 3 and so on. Pi 1 is contained in pi 2, contained in pi 3, and so on. Furthermore, pi 1 is contained in sigma 2, and sigma 1 is contained in pi 2, and similarly here, and so on. And at the end, we have 
pH, polynomial hierarchy, the union of all of these guys. And here is a uh, not a difficult claim, so um, yeah, let me put it as a claim. You might ask now, okay, what's an upper bound on pH? Is there an upper bound on pH? Or what's a natural upper bound on pH? Uh, what do you think it is? Anyone have a guess? P space. P space? Absolutely. So why is it contained in P space? Yeah. There's a one language that uh, it's like the you can sap, but it has, you can have quantifiers. T, you're talking about the true uh, quantified Boolean formulas, yes. right? So that's complete for uh, P space, and that should give you an idea why this is contained in. Because there you have like uh, n quantification, uh, and how 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 do you show that it's in P space? So you can like you can reuse the space for the quantifiers. So for example, let's take something like um, if I said like there exists for all, and then you have a polynomial machine. Just this one. How do you show that this is in P space? Well, you go through one by one of uh, all the possibilities. So you set u to be the first variable u to be like zero 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 zero. And then for this 0, 0, 0, you go through all the possibilities for u2 one by one. But when, when you're doing that going through, you can always reuse that space that you're using. Right? So I just need like uh, a space allocated for the first variable, as another space allocated for the second variable. And as I'm going through each of these possibilities, I just reuse that space. So I'm not using more and more space. Um, so you try every possibility there, then you go back here, increment this, and then try every possibility there, and so on and so forth. Every time you're running your verifier V and checking whether you know, you're getting uh, the answers you expect. Uh, and of course, if you have constant number of quantifiers, then it's fine, right? So you have constant times polynomial space that you're using. So that's kind of like the idea. Uh, so, well, if you if you if you have nothing to do, I guess you can write it out. Uh, but it's not going to be an interesting proof. It's uh, I, mean, I just I just told you what it is. Okay. So now, okay, let me give you the complexity chain that you might have seen before. L is contained in N L, and L is contained in P. P is contained in M P, and then. Here I can like add all the infinitely many uh, uh, guys and sigma i's and pi i's, but let me just put pH, and pH is contained in p space. P space uh, is contained in exp. Exp is contained in non-deterministic exponential time, and so on. And then it goes on. Okay, so there's we have put something now between MP and P space. Not only that, we have put infinitely many actually complexity classes between uh, M, um, NP and P space. Okay. So now let's come back here. So how many people here believe P is different from MP? You weren't expecting this question. <laughs> how many believe it's equal, they're equal? Anyone believe they're equal? No one? So here is, I'm going to now give you, uh, show you a result that, um, Kind of, you can take it as um, maybe more evidence towards believing P is different from MP, if you will. Okay. Um, so yeah, here we go. So the theorem is, and yeah, I don't have half an hour left. Mm. 
Yeah, I'll probably give you like the sketch of the proof without doing it very formally. Uh, but okay, so the theorem is um, P equals MP implies, anyone can guess what it implies? P equals MP. Some, it's something related to polynomial hierarchy, obviously. Yeah. Yes, exactly. P equals PH. If you can show P is equal to MP, the polynomial hierarchy, and I mean the, 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 the way people like to phrase this is that the polynomial hierarchy collapses to P. Okay? People like to usually draw this picture, I'll draw it this way. People like to draw it like this way, where like the hierarchy goes up, and then you're saying, oh, everything crumbles down to P, if P equals MP. What was the intuition? Do you, well, why do you think this is true? I'm gonna give you the intuition. What does P equals MP mean, in some sense? P equals, there exists P, yeah. Sigma 2 is equal to pi 2. Um, right, but Where why? Is equal to pi one? Right, so that's right. So, so suppose, so the, 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 the point is that MP is there exists P, and you're saying there exists P is equal to P. So you're kind of saying, you know what? I can just get rid of that there exists quantifier in some sense. Okay. And the th second thing is, if P equals MP, then that equals co-MP, right? That's what we saw uh, somewhere. I, I think I wrote that. If P equals MP, then MP equals co-MP. So then you're saying P equals co-MP, and co-MP is for all P. Then you're saying P is equal to for all P. So now you're also telling me I can also get rid of this for all quantifier too. So I can get rid of the exist quantifier. I just can get rid of for all quantifier. So I just keep get re getting rid of them. So wherever you are, you can just ke keep getting rid of them and go down to P. That's the intuition. Okay, so suppose, I mean, let me write this down. Suppose P equals MP. Then uh, we know that P equals MP, which, is, which we characterize as there exists P. And then also P equals co-MP, uh, which is for all P. Uh, so here the implication is that we can get rid of um, there exists and for all quantifiers. Okay, I mean look, this is not a proof, this is just like the idea, uh, but it's a very accurate uh, I, uh, intuition. So. Um, okay, so if, if you have now, let's say, there exists, so let's take like sigma uh, 2. Sigma 2 is there exists for all P. So there exists for all P, but now I know for all P is P. So this is like there exists P then. And there exists P is NP which is P. And if I look at similarly for pi 2, this is for all there exists P. But there exists P is P. So this is like for all P. But then for all P is P. Uh, and yeah, I mean, let me do maybe one more. Sigma 3 is there exists for all there exists P. But now I've shown you that for all there exists P is P. So that makes this there exists P. There exists P is P. And so on. Yeah, yeah I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have time to prove this for me. 
Um, so yeah, so to prove this formally, you can basically do an induction proof, induction on uh, the I. The, so you want to show basically that pH, you want to show pH is in um, P. Uh, so for each I, you want to show that sigma I is in P and pi I is in P. And then you show it by induction on I. The base case corresponds to basically the assumption that P equals MP. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, pi, that's pi 1 and sigma 1. And then now assuming that sigma I minus 1 is in P and pi I minus 1 is in P, you can show that sigma I is going to be in P and pi I is going to be in P. I think you can believe that. So, and you know, there's a way to formally do this. Good. Moving on. Here's another related uh, um, theorem. This is theorem theorem two with a similar proof. So this is like um, if sigma i equals pi i for some i, then what do you think happens? So here we were like, okay, this is like sigma 0 equals sigma 1. This is now sigma i equals pi i. Like if you take i to be 1, for example, a special case of this would be Let's say MP equals co MP. What do you think would happen in that case if MP equals co MP? Any guesses? What might be the answer? Yeah? Two equal two. Pi i plus one. So everything, yeah. So okay, everything. pH becomes, and pH already contains everything below. Everything collapses to sigma i. If it was MP equals co MP, everything collapses to MP, which is equal uh, co MP. Um, yeah. So again, this is like saying. People like to say the hierarchy collapses to the ith level. Okay, so again, I can give you the intuition, which is going to be similar. Um, so here, let me demonstrate it. Uh, with MP equals co MP, but it's the same idea. So suppose MP equals co MP. Um, then I want to show that pH equals MP. So this, what does this mean? Again, like when you write it in this way, you know, things become clear. So you know that there exists P equals for all P. So if there exists P is for all P, then if I now look at there exists for all P, then what can I say? Well, this for all P is there exists P. So now I have there exists, there exists P. Okay, so I was able to switch. So this allows me basically, as you can see, switch a there exists quantifier to a for all quantifier in some sense. So when I have there exists for all P, now I have there exists, there exists P, and now this is equal to there exists P. Because as I mentioned uh, based on your question, right, if you have two there exists in a row, you there exists U1, there exists U2, you can combine them into one there exists uh, quantification for one variable. And similarly, for all there exists P, if I look at this, <coughs> Well, there exists P is for all P. 
So this allows me to say this is for all for all p, which is for all p. Okay, which actually is there exists p. And you know, let me do one more. There exists for all, there exists p. Well now I know from the previous part that for all there exists p is equal to there exists p. So this is there exists, there exists p, which is there exists p, and so on. Okay? So no matter what high level I go in, I can collapse it to uh, there exists p, which is np. This is because I started from np equals co np. If I start at a deeper level, you can do the same thing and collapse it to that level. Okay. So here's an implication of this. Um, uh, if L uh, is in, if L in, in uh, MP intersection coin P is NP complete. Then, so if you have a language in NP intersection coin P that's NP complete, then you can actually show that NP has to be equal to co NP, which then implies. Um, as we just saw, uh, pH equals n. Okay. So then, if you don't believe, and most people do not believe, so maybe I should make a comment about that, what experts believe about the polynomial hierarchy. So people believe that each of these levels are distinct, like uh, you have different complexity classes, larger and larger complexity classes, and that the polynomial hierarchy is not expected to collapse. Um, and and you can see like here, you can take this as evidence that we don't expect a language in MP intersection co MP to be MP complete. Okay, because if that happened, then the whole hierarchy would collapse to MP. Okay. Uh, so a good example of this is, um, oh, by the way, let me just like, the idea of this is, what's the idea of this? So if, uh, L is NP complete, then for all K in NP, uh, K reduces to L. But now L is in co NP, so that implies K is in co NP. I don't know if you've seen this. Have you seen this? Like if you, uh, if K reduces to L and L is in NP, then K is an MP under these reductions. Similarly, if K reduces to L and L is in co MP, then K is going to be in co MP. You can also show that. Uh, so that's what I'm using here. Um, K reduces to L, but I know L is in co MP, so that means K is in NP. Uh, so, uh, K is in co MP, sorry. But this is true for all K in MP. So that means all K in MP is also in co MP. In co -MP. So NP is contained in co MP. Okay, so this implies that MP is contained in co MP. And that actually implies from that you can also derive the other direction, uh, MP equals co MP. Okay, and then by this theorem, that would imply it's equal to pH. And yeah, so a good example of this was like, let's take, um, like a integer factorization, okay? Very important problem in computational complexity. We hope it's hard problem because many of the crypto systems uh, rely on the assumption that it's a hard problem. Um, now, it would be great if this problem that we hope is hard is actually MP complete. That would give us more confidence that it's actually hard. So then you could say if P is different from MP, then we know factoring is hard. But uh, unfortunately, 
uh, factoring problem, well, factoring problem is not a language, but the language version of the factoring problem uh, is an NP intersection coin. So we don't expect it to be NP complete. In fact, we don't expect to be able to base any of crypto systems on, an MP, on the hardness of an MP complete language. Um, so that's kind of uh, sad, but yeah, so let me just give you this example very quickly. So if we look at like a decision version of a um, factoring problem, let's call it smallest factor. Um, so this one, let's say it's pair of numbers and T such that uh, N has a non-trivial factor uh, less than or equal to T, let's say. Okay, so given N and T, uh, we want that N has a non-trivial factor less than or equal to T. And this is, you know, I claim, in and P intersection co MP. Why is it in MP? How can I uh, prove to you that this is in the language and T? I yeah. give yeah. yeah the I give you the factor. <laughs> okay? And you can check that it's indeed a factor. How do you show that it's in co MP? How can how can I prove to you that there is no factor between 1 and t? The prime factorization? Yeah. Give me the prime factorization. And then first I'll multiply things out and see that it's a prime factorization. And then uh, I can check that you, know, you don't have a factor less than t. Good. So yeah, that's kind of a negative. Uh, Result, I guess, you know, it's that this is not MP complete. All right, so now quickly, uh, let me say a few things about, like you might wonder now, like, does this class have, or these sigmas and pi i's have na um, complete problems? Okay. You know, Ryan might have told you, like, a language or a complexity class is worth studying if they're like natural complete problems for that class. Has he said that? Okay. So when we certify that it doesn't have a factor smaller than t, we also have to certify that the factors are prime, right? Uh, yeah. So just do that with like prime certificate. You have to use primality probably, right? So complete problems, so indeed there are some complete uh, problems. But unfortunately I'm also going to uh, negate what Ryan said, <laughs> as you'll see. So do we have complete problems for these things? Uh, okay, so there's actually a very, very natural, I mean, you might, if I like force you to like come up with a complete problem for sigma i, uh, I think this is the problem that you would uh, come up with. Uh, so it would be a generalization of uh, SAT, and in some sense a restriction of uh, quantified Boolean formula, uh, T, TQBF. So let uh, phi, uh, y1, y2, yi be a Boolean formula where each yj is a uh, vector or sequence of uh, Boolean variables. Okay, so I think of it this way I have variables x1 to xn, and I partition them into vectors or sets 
So y1 corresponds to some subset of the xi's, y2 is another subset of the xi's, and so on. Okay, but together, um, together y1 to yj does correspond to all these variables x1, x2, xn. And then now I can define sigma i sat to be the language uh, of all these uh, formulas y1, y2, yi such that um, there exists some value z1 for all z2 and so on and so forth um, phi of z1, z2, zi is 1 Okay, satisfiable or like true, true Boolean formulas, Boolean formulas that uh, have truth value. Um, and then you can show, I'll leave this as an exercise to you, that sigma i sat is uh, sigma i complete. Okay. Similarly, you can define, although I'm not defined, I haven't defined, but similarly, you can define pi i sat, obviously, and that's going to be pi i complete. Okay, and if you like, how can I show this? Well, I mean, one way is like just to think about, you know, Cook Levin theorem. Just close your eyes, imagine the reduction, and then you will see like you can basically do exactly the same thing. Okay, it's like just copy the proof and you'll get the same thing. Obviously, I'm not going to do that. Um, how about pH? How about pH complete problems? Okay, so now here's the claim. If there exists an L such that L is pH complete, then what do you think will happen? Then there exists I such that pH equals sigma I. The polynomial hierarchy collapses to the ith level. And this is, uh, this is why I'm negating what Ryan said because here's a complexity class, very natural one. Uh, and if you believe that the hierarchy does not collapse, then it does not have a complete problem. And the proof is actually pretty simple. So how can we prove this? If L is uh, pH complete, then if, first of all, it's in pH by definition. So L is in pH, which means there exists some I such that L is in sigma I. And we know that for all K in pH, K reduces to L. And then what does that mean? Again, by like the similar kind of thing that I discussed before. So if K reduces to L and you know that L is in sigma I, then K is also going to be in sigma I. Okay, so this implies that pH is contained in sigma I. Everything in pH can be put into sigma I. Okay. So now we can, last thing I wanna explore is, okay, so 
what about the relationship between pH and P space? So we saw that pH is contained in P space. Would you expect them to be equal, let's say? Okay, so you know pH um, is contained in P space. But now, like, I mean, I guess you can guess, but you also know TQBF is P space complete. And you also know that if pH was equal to P space, then pH would have a complete problem. TQBF would be a complete problem for it. So corollary is if pH equals P space, then pH equals sigma i for some i collapses. Yeah, and so and then we don't, you know, we don't expect uh, pH uh, to be equal to P space. And in some sense, intuitively, right, pH corresponds to all those languages that have a constant number of quantifiers. And P space actually corresponds to all those languages where the number of quantifiers is allowed to depend on uh, the input. So there, like, you're basically quantifying everything, uh, or allowed to quantify, let me say, everything. Okay, and then we believe that that actually gives you a much larger, gives you much more power and much larger class. All right, so. That's basically all I wanted to say uh, today. And I think Ryan will continue this discussion next time on Tuesday and give you um, another equivalent definition of uh, polynomial hierarchy uh, using uh, Oracle, Oracles and Oracle Turing machines. Uh, and uh, that's also a very interesting and important uh, area in complexity theory, the discussion of Oracles, Oracle worlds like uh, what if I said, like, what if we, I said I, we live in a world where there's a magic box that is all sat for us for free? Okay, so there's this black box, and whenever you give a sat instance, it gives you the correct answer. What happens in this world? What, what kind of complex, like, in this world, what are the relationship between complexity classes? Uh, and you, of course, you can, you can take that uh, thought and run with it, and you know think about other things as well. What if you had uh, other kinds of black boxes and so on. Okay, so yeah, that's also interesting stuff. So you probably see that next time. All right, thank you.